Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Kalen. I, uh, I'm one of the members of ROAR. I'm going to be taking I'm going to be taking you through about the first half of our presentation, and then Tara will take you through the second half. So uh, let me just bring up my little presentation that I've got. My computer would cooperate. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, gotta love it. Um, all right. So, uh, my half of the presentation is um, basically going to go through. Um, common weeds that you find uh, around your property, typically in your lawn. I'm, I'm really gonna focus in on that. Um, and one of the reasons why I'm doing this is because there's a lot of plants that get mistaken um, that are very beneficial and during a typical lawn cycle or how some people do it with herbicides and landscaping maintenance. Um, you actually lose some of these species, and these species can be um, very beneficial, uh, very beneficial in more ways than one. So, just to kind of give you an overview of what I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to be focusing mainly on these five questions. Um, I do have a tendency to get a little technical, so um, if I run through something really quick and you use a term that's that's um, confusing or doesn't make any sense uh please just write that uh in the chat and i'll <laughs> we can address it um at a later point but essentially i want to start um with the pure definition of what a weed is um and then the rest of the presentation i'm going to be trying to convince you um, why you should care, at least of, about the ones that I'm presenting. And Tara has a whole host of other ones that she's going to be presenting on. So to get started, the famous question, um, the pure definition of a weed is just a plant that is growing in the wrong place that is hindering a process. Um, so that is extremely vague. It does not cover whether it is a native or non-native plant. And in honesty, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, this, uh, and coming off of that, the reason for it, both non-native and native plants do serve a purpose, especially some of the herbaceous weeds that you find typically within a, within a lawn environment or even a backyard environment. So your entire goal with this should be to um, work with these plants and not against them. It's going to be a uh, it's going to be an uphill battle going completely against these herbaceous plants, as many lawn owners would know, because of dandelions and how fast that they can spread from area to area. So um, using dandelions as an example. Um, you don't want to completely eradicate them, um, but you also don't want to over, you don't want your lawn overrun with just pure dandelions. So if you can keep a small section um, off to the side or in a different section where it's extremely managed, you're providing a you're providing a whole host of benefits and mainly looking at the in, insect value. Um, and pollinator value. It is it is um, one of the it's one of the better plants because of how early it blooms. Um, it's one of the first available pollen sources um, to a lot of our native bees and uh, pollinators. So, like I said, and uh, let's see if I could. I'm just hoping that everybody can kind of see the uh, 
the image that I have on here. Uh, when you see these, uh, when you see these weeds in your lawn, um, you may ask, "What's so special? Why should you care? All that fun stuff." Um, basically, turf grass is kind of just a uh, it's just a one tone. Um, typically, it doesn't get high enough to bloom, so it's not even a pollinating source. Um, a lot of these other weeds that you can find um, kind of, they bloom even if they're chopped down, um, even if they're heavily trampled on. Some of them are actually adapted to do that. Um, you stretch what your pollinating window is, even from your garden out over a wider landscape, um, just kind of showed by this image, uh, how snowdrop and crocus are usually one of the first ones that come up. And then some of the ones that I'll be talking about are goldenrods and some of the aster species where they're blooming very, very late in the year. One of the last pollen sources for uh, honeybees and uh, bumblebees before winter really hits. Um, and also when you start looking at some of the uh, common weeds, uh, clover is another one that people try to manage really hard. Um, clover and some of these others that you can find are actually in the legume family or the bean family. Uh, mainly one of the key characteristics there is that the roots actually um, fix nitrogen. So it kind of helps the plants around them. It adds a secondary soil benefit um, just from just from basically existing there to the plants around it to kind of help um, boost everything up, make more nitrogen available. Uh, so there's reasons why you can start looking at very specific plants as to um, should you keep it, should you try to manage it a little bit farther. Uh, and, and another thing about these weeds and specifically native weeds, they are extremely low maintenance. I mean, it, they are adapted to this type of environment. They're adapted to this type of soil moisture. They will flower, they will flower at four inches high after repetitive mowings throughout the entire summer. Um, you will still find, you will still find them uh, come late in the year when the grass is starting to brown off um, and die off. You'll still find all of this stuff because it's it's adapted to these climates. Um, and another great benefit of this is that it they don't require any um, fertilizers or extra added sources. Because again, the soil type, if they're already in the soil type, they've already been adapted to this. Um, so this is also kind of a way um, you can cut down on the fertilizer budget and an herbicide requirement for your total lawn whole, uh, whole stop. So um, just another added benefit to it. Um, and where I kind of come with this is that I'm looking at native plants um, and the root systems basically for water drainage. Uh, again, they don't need they don't need a lot of water and they don't need a lot of fertilizers. Uh, and as you can see uh, in this image, the left the leftmost little green tuft is your typical turf grass, and everything to the right of it is a native uh, a native plant that you could possibly find even in your own backyard. Um, and just to kind of give a little bit of a preview, the uh, Missouri goldenrod is actually very similar to the showy goldenrod, which I'll be talking about a little bit later. So just in comparison between the root depths there, um, and the numbers are the numbers are a little hard to see, um, and I can blow up this image if people actually want to see it afterwards. Um, the numbers on the left hand side across the black line going down are actually um, that's numbered one through 25 in terms of foot deep. So uh, again, 
these native plants have been adapted to this environment. There's a reason why they can tolerate all these different conditions. Um, with those tap roots, they obviously don't need any water. Um, and again, as low maintenance as they come, and they're sturdy to a lot of different diseases. It doesn't need to be manicured. It doesn't need to be taken care of. It's just kind of plant it and let it go. Um, so I, I would suggest if you have a wet spot in your lawn, maybe think about just letting that go to a, a native area, possibly think about a, a, a rain garden for these, uh, for these very reasons. Uh, so I know in the grand scheme, especially looking at a lawn, there's a lot of green, there's a lot of small stems, and it's going to get very, very hard to identify a lot of this. Um, mostly what I talk, mostly what I focus on are the aster families, um, and the aster families encompasses not only um, pure asters, but it also covers stuff like ironweed and the goldenrod family. And all of them have in common is they start their life as a basal rosette. So they're only going to be about the size of a hockey puck um, sitting real, real low in the ground um, and probably won't even be higher than the turf grass that's around. But come the end of August to October, um, they're, depending on the species, they're going to be up uh, somewhere between three foot and I think the tallest is uh, six and a half with the, with the largest golden rods. Um, so, I mean, with weeds, it, uh, the numbers can also kind of give away exactly um, what the differences are. Um, again, dandelions are a great example. Um, those are easy to identify. Um, these native ones can be a little bit tricky because they they can kind of blend in with everything else. So I've got I've got about six that are relatively common. And if you live somewhere near a meadow, um, actually probably within five miles of a meadow um, or any area that has these plants, you might actually have them in your lawn uh, yourself. Um, there are definitely some other ones that are way more common than these, but Tara will be covering them and uh, she will she will provide better detail than I ever could on that. So uh, without further ado, we'll start in on the golden rods and specifically this one's the showy golden rod. And like I said, it starts its life basically as a little hockey puck in, in, both, in both size and, uh, and height. Um, so this can easily be overlooked, it can easily be mowed or accidentally treated. Um, I would say this provides a really nice pop late in the fall. So if you can relocate this, um, it'll, it'll provide some serious benefits. It's a, it's a major pollinating source. It's a real nice pop of yellow. Highly recommend it. Um, and again, uh, very common if you live somewhere near a meadow, you probably see this quite a bit. Um, the next is in the aster family, and this specific aster is a uh, New England aster. So it starts its life again, very, very small, very, very tiny, um, probably doesn't get any bigger. When it first starts its life, it's probably not any bigger than your uh, typical typical cereal bowl. Um, and again, it really kind of stays around that three inch height for a while until somewhere in the middle of summer, and then it really puts on the grill. Um, it's got nice, beautiful flowers that are about the size of a half dollar. Um, nice. Uh, it's a nice purple petal with a yellow inside. Um, again, it's a favorite pollinating source. Um, a, another late bloomer that can persist all the way up into November, depending on the year. Um, so I would definitely try to relocate this if this comes up. Um, 
Um, but again, this, this gets confused for grass quite a bit, especially when it stays really, really low for most of the year. Uh, another one is uh, wood nettle. This kind of blends in between some of the non-native stuff that you can find. Um, typically, if you have uh, a woodland edge, you will actually find this plant a little bit more often. It's not as potent as the stinging nettles that are a little bit more common on uh, open areas and um, uh, like disturbed fields and whatnot. This is actually more of a hardy understory, uh, understory herbaceous plant. Um, it's, uh, it's a favorite food source of some very specific butterflies. Um, so again, if you see it, I would try to work with this one um, because the really cool thing about it is the, the one of the butterflies that's attracted to this it, um, has see-through wings and it's, uh, it's kind of cool to see. Um, but it, it's, it's a major food source for a lot of little critters. So I would definitely recommend even just trying to keep it in that woodland edge if you could, um, if you do see it in your lawns or property. Uh, Second to last one I've got for you is um, ironweed, specifically New York ironweed. Um, and again, this is in the aster family, so it starts its, it starts its life very, very low, very, very compact. A again, probably about the size of a hockey puck, both um, circumference and height. But this one is a September um, full bloom. Uh, there are meadow stretches that I visit um, for work that have New York aster late in the year, and it is loaded with butterflies of every species. Um, this is this is one of those plants. Um, that if you do if you do find this, I would try to make this a center point in a garden because of how heavily it blooms and how many butterflies actually visit this thing. It, there have been points where these plants have been bowed over with the amount of butterflies that have been feeding on these flowers. Um, so it's going to be more common if, again, you live relatively close to open fields, but this is, this is a very cosmopolitan species. You can find it almost anywhere. Um, and hence the name, it doesn't, it doesn't take a lot for this plant to grow. Um, and it's got a very established root system. So it's, uh, it's relatively hard to dig up too. Um, but again, highly recommended, it's relatively common. Keep your eye out for it. Um, and everybody's favorite monarch food, um, I'll round it off with milkweeds. Um, typically, uh, you can find these almost anywhere. Um, I will say that uh, they're a little bit more noticeable than the aster families when it comes to uh, weed forms, but um, the image on the right that says typical first year milkweed plant, that's actually a, uh, it's, uh, it's called butterfly, it's called butterfly weed. It's a, uh, it's a branch in the uh, milkweed family, um, closer related to swamp milkweed than common milkweed, um, produces big clusters of bright orange flowers. Um, uh, it's mostly found in open pastures again, but can spread very, very far. Um, and the left image is just your stereotypical common milkweed when it just starts coming up. So again, just try to keep an eye out for it. Um, and if you do find it and you don't want it specifically in your lawn, just try to move it off and still provide those pollinating benefits. It's a, it's a free seed bank. Uh, oh, I apologize, I had one more. Um, 
blue eye grass is in the iris family. Um, you can tell by the flat leaves down at the bottom. In the left image, if you look almost directly to where the soil, uh, the soil top is and where the plant begins, those leaves are actually flat in on each other. It's, it's true with just about every other member of the iris family. Um, this is the closest grass look-alike native plant that we have that blooms as heavily as this does. Um, it's relatively common. Um, however, there are certain circumstances you need to meet in terms of um, soil, uh, soil moisture requirements and uh, certain types of soil. Um, it can be, uh, this blue eye grass can be found throughout the state. Um, but again, there, there's just a little bit of specifics, but this is, this is one that's going to blend in almost exactly looking like turf grass. And uh, unfortunately it, it'll, it will probably take, um, it will almost take a magnifying glass to try to tell the difference between the two. Um, so, with that all said, it's uh, it's it's sounding kind of like a daunting task of trying to get all of this stuff in line. And, and is this one thing? Is this another? Um, and I would say, um, if you don't know, um, then one of the one of the easiest things is just to. Um, mow a little less frequently. If you suspect something in your lawn is one thing um, that you would want, um, a native perennial or even a non-native perennial that can be relatively managed easily, um, then I would say start small. Um, take that little section out, um, maybe mow it a little less frequently than, than a typical mowing. Um, if you can identify it after maybe a week um, from when your typical mowing schedule happens and you identified the plant or are trying to identify the plant, um, that will give it enough time to really push up a bunch of growth and you can definitively tell um, if it's one thing over the other. Um, I would also say, I think the only pest that you would actually have a problem with in any of these circumstances are going to be deer and possibly rabbits. But again, these native plants are, they are adapted to tolerate this stuff. So with goldenrod, especially uh, showy goldenrod, it doesn't grow that high to begin with. Um, however, there are circumstances where even cutting, showing, going, showy goldenrod in half um, from its typical height, somewhere around two and a half foot, um, it will actually still bloom at that small height. Uh, it's, it's the same thing with the asters. The asters may not be totally thrilled with getting, uh, getting a haircut like that, but they will still bloom profusely even at a smaller height. Uh, and again, if you don't want them in that specific area, then I just suggest to try to find a new home for it. Maybe an unused corner, maybe a low spot, um, just some something that's out of the way, but it can still provide the benefits that it, um, that is adapted to. Um, so that's gonna wrap up my stuff. And here are a couple of good resources um, that give you a little bit more in, uh, information and. Uh, specifically, a lot of uh, a lot of pictures and identification tools that, if you don't know what something is within your lawn, you can go to these places and uh, identify it. Hopefully, um, and there's also a source on there that kind of gives you a um, a changing uh, changing the thought of the type process in that uh, Pennsylvania Landscape Nursery Association work. Uh, so that will do it for me. And I can probably um, answer some questions. I did see that there's some stuff in chat. Um, so I will 
just stop screen sharing. Okay, so um, first question in chat was um, from Karen, other than polling, how can you eradicate poison ivy? Um, that, is, <laughs> that is a daunting task any way you spin it, unfortunately. Um, as much as I don't like going the chemical route, if you want to eradicate it, um, I believe the best solution is doing that. If you have a bunch of vines growing up the tree, you can, uh, you can do a little bit more of a um, non-toxic route. Um, uh, vinegar and salt does a lot of wonders dehydrating uh, the base of uh, the base of those vines, but if you have a widespread area with a subterranean um, vine, that that is a bigger problem, unfortunately. And the next question was, um, what to do with uh, with a yard that's already overrun. Um, As much as I would say, try to, I would say try to work with some of these weeds, especially with the blooming windows. Um, but if um, if you want a pure lawn, then um, see, uh, maybe reseeding and um, using a little bit of cardboard to shade out the shade out the areas that you don't want. Um, there's some. Uh, alternative um, alternative herbicides that are not herbicides um, that can target some of this stuff a little bit better. But I, I, I do suggest at least let it go a little bit to identify it. And if it's a native beneficial, then re relocate it somewhere that it's not a problem. Um, and then in the areas that do eventually die off. Um, just reseed with a with a new turf grass, turf grass mix, um, and it should take right off. A lot of the, a lot of the ready-made stuff um, that we have uh, we have available um, does wonders. Um, doesn't need a whole lot of uh, doesn't need a whole lot of fertilizer. Um, honestly, some of the stuff is just water and go. So. Um, I hope that answers the questions and uh, I'll just turn it over to Tara at this point. Thanks, Kaylin. That was awesome. So much to learn. <laughs> and yeah, that question about grass, I know, um, I know this is indie, but we, you know, there is that Healthy Lawns website. So um, I know sometimes homeowners associations have a particular look that they need, regardless if you may want something different, you know, more natural lawn um, to actually go through that natural conversion process and welcome the actual weeds that are beneficial, like Kaylin said, or could be edible, like I'm going into. So I know that could be kind of tough, but that Healthy Lawns um, site is, or Healthy Yards website is good. Um, I have that, I can pop that in the chat and I'll talk a little bit about it too. But I don't know if you wanted to chat about anything, Indy. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take a look. Okay. Um, but I'll, I'm going to go into um, another angle too. It's a little bit about appreciating these plants that we call weeds. And that's all about, you know, thinking about them in a different philosophy in your life or appreciating them in a different way. I know, um, you know, in growing up, we, especially here in the U.S., have a certain thought process about weeds wanting to get rid of them as though they're always bad. And as Kaylin mentioned, there are so many benefits, you know, to wildlife and also to human life, as I'll talk about, as many of them are actually 
edible, but also medicinal and supportive to your life. And the local um, indigenous peoples, the Lenape here, use a lot of these plants as medicine. And I know some of, a lot of these weeds are not necessarily native and can be invasive, but there are a lot of benefits and it's um, kind of in my life to appreciate these plants, no matter what we see them as, as invasive or non-native, but just to appreciate them because somewhere they're native. <laughs> and um, so I'll be kind of going into that here a little bit and hopefully opening some thoughts about um, and new views of these plants. So. Um, but I want to just a caveat here. I'm, uh, I'm a little full disclosure. I'm not a medical professional or a trained herbalist. So please do your own research on what and how much you can serve any of these plants that I'm going to be talking about. Um, many have some research behind them or some don't, um, some don't have recommended dosages, but you just need to do your own research. And some are actually sold in stores and in pharmacies now, so that's really incredible. Um, but these are kind of like my top 10 plus. <laughs> there are so many more, you know, there's Japanese knotweed a lot that Kaylin went over. There are wild berries and edible ferns, but in light of time, I'm going to just go over these top ones that a lot of you'll see now. So, um, you know, so let's go over some of them, you know, the ones that you don't want to be without. Um, but a few things to mention here with wild edibles, which is um, something that kind of has always been around, just people foraging, but it's really become more popular in the past, you know, five years or so. I've been foraging for, I don't know, for a long, long time, um, since I was really little with my family, um, but didn't really know a, about this, you know, but there's some things just to keep in mind, some about etiquette and relationship with the plants and also just precautions for you. But of course, know the area that you're getting these plants from because as Kaylin mentioned, you know, a lot of them could be treated if they're part of your natural lawn landscape and you've, you've been treating them, you probably don't want to consume anything in your lawn um, or a roadside. So just be cautious of where you're harvesting anything from. And always wash what you harvest because insect frass, which can be undetected, <laughs> um, you can't hardly see it. it, could be there and just anything else. There could be egg larvae on, on the other side of leaves, so you just want to check those out and wash. Um, always use ID, ID guides. I'll give you some ID tips here and some that are, could be confused with each other, but there's some really great guides out there. I'll show you in just a minute some place, places to go for that, in addition to the sites that Kaylin mentioned. And also consult a doctor if you have any, you know, current conditions, because some of these, especially the greens, have oxalic acids, which can leach too much calcium for your body, just like kale and spinach, if you eat too much of it. So there's some things that um, you should be mindful of if you have any conditions that um, to be concerned about. And then, of course, just be mindful of over-harvesting. Um, some of these disperse in our annuals by seeds. Some are biennials. Some are perennials. Some distribute through rhizome. Um, some are, you know, bulbs. So just be careful and mindful of what you're over-harvesting because some of these species, especially in the alliums, the onions, um, especially like ramps, have been really um, kind of impacted by the wild foraging momentum. So it's good just to be... Uh, conscientious of them if you want to keep them around year to year. But again, there's some guides actually local to us here in Pennsylvania. Peterson's always get a good guide to go to a lot you can find used online. Um, but there's also some other great online resources. Plants for Future has got a lot of good um, uh, medicine, medicinal and benefits of wildlife on their um, website. Penn State Extension has some hit or misses on, on weeds. Um, and edibles, and then North Creek Nurseries, actually local to us, has a really great site where you can actually search their database of plants and look for what plants are good in your landscape um, and what ones that you want to plant. Um, I actually have planted some of these weeds, quote unquote weeds, in at my farm and got my um, seeds from Baker Creek um, Seeds online, and they're um, they're really great to grow on your own, too. If you don't have a, a source of them that you feel is safe, you can buy the seeds online and grow them yourself. 
But this is a website I'd love to mention. It's just a really good resource if you're thinking of converting your, your lawn and you can to a more natural landscape that's healthy for you and wildlife. Maybe you can um, also forage from it. They have a lot of great ideas about how to get out of that monoculture of your lawn, which we're not telling you to do, but if it's a possibility, you might want to consider it. And the things that you might need, the steps along the way that you'll need to consider in doing that. And you can always just take it, you know, baby steps in doing this, thinking about it, but really it is living in more harmony with a natural as much as possible landscape, because some of these, again, are non-native or invasive, but they've got really, really great tips and ideas of plants to plant, how to speak the speak and work with landscape professionals and maybe homeowners associations. So really, really great website to check out. And May is actually um, a no mo May theme. So you might want to look that up and check it out. There's a lot being posted right now on social media about this type of this month. So, and at least that's in the UK. <laughs> but we're going to go into some of, um, I think, 10 or 12 different species here. I'll try to just be quick, but you can always watch the replay and look some of these up on your own. But one of my favorites that also is very, <laughs> that can really, really hurt is stinging nettle. Um, Kaylin mentioned this one too. And this is one that I actually have seeds, bought them, and I called it, grew them myself to plant at the farm so I could have a lot of them because I love to dry and I love to eat this plant all year round. There's so many great things about it. But it is from Europe and Asia. Um, it has a white yellowish flower that's very, very tiny. The leaves are heart-shaped and can get up to three feet tall. Um, it is a perennial and the leaves do sting, hence the name. And um, it's like little hypodermic needles on the stems, the leaves, and their flowers, and they're called trichomes. So these are little glass-like silica-based needles that inject a, a mixture, a cocktail of very irritating chemicals upon contact. Sometimes when I'm out in the wild and I just I don't have my gloves, I'll still go in and harvest, but it could take hours for it to dissipate out of your body. And there's some remedies that you can use to kind of try to take that stinging or reduce it, but um, it includes histamines and serotonins and some acids and things, all really cool things to put into your body. <laughs> um, but Root Roar has a July 2020, we have um, a little bit more about stinging nettles and recipes too, so you might want to check that out on our website. We have our links to all of our newsletters, but that July 2020 has got a little bit about stinging nettle. Um, but it's out now throughout the summer and prefers full sun and you can find it near um, the edges of riverine habitats. It is beneficial um, for some animals, but mostly it actually is, um, acts as like an aphid trap, which then other insects will come and consume and birds. So there's just a little bit of benefit that way. If you're going to harvest it, wear gloves. Um, get some scissors and a, a paper bag and then you can harvest the tops before you get out the blooms and you can um, make hot tea or I love cold tea with it um, and I like to put a little bit of lemon and ginger and steep it and then make it cold for the summer. It's so good for you. It's got so many vitamins in it, omegas, iron. Um, it's said to reduce inflammation and blood pressure, re you know, regulation, support your liver and cleansing it as well. And then um, there's just so many things you can do. You can just even just blanch it and eat the greens, which, you know, as soon as you do that, those stinging hairs are destroyed when it's and it's cooked. So it's very tasty. One of my favorites, and it's been a, a staple in herbal medicine um, since ancient times. Ancient Egyptians and Romans have used it, and um, it's pretty pretty incredible plant. So check that one out, but with caution, of course. <laughs> um, Another nettle, but it's different, is called dead nettle, which also can be confused with what is called a henbit. And this is an easy one to, to forage. Both henbit and dead nettle are edible. They're very nutritious. Um, they're high in lots of good things like fiber, vitamins A and C, potassium, antioxidants. Um, it's a lamium. It's part of the mint family but it is native to Europe and Asia, but it's an invasive here. 
grows about to four to 12 inches high and can be found on roadsides and other disturbed areas. Um, but there are some differences between the two. So dead nettle there is on the left and it has um, overlapping leaves. They both have purple flowers and they both have square stems. So if you feel them, they have actual edges. They're about the same height too, but the leaves are a little bit different even though they're both alternate. Um, the dead nettle, purple dead nettle on the left, the leaves are triangular and have little tiny hairs on them and the leaves overlap with each other. So you can't really see the stem up there in the upper portion, whereas um, the hembit on the right are kidney-shaped leaves, very scalloped, and lack the hair. And they're a little bit glossy, so and the flowers are a little bit, a little bit larger. Um, but they're out now. They actually are kind of like a winter annual, and they kind of come up, and they, they're out for a little while, and they flower throughout the year, March through October, at least here. But again, they're part of the, the mint family, and they're just, just so amazing to eat. Um, but, and they are a good nectar source during the winter for other, um, for other wildlife. But a lot, like a lot of these plants, these weeds, they love disturbed areas. And these actually grow in colonies, and henbit and dead nettle are usually found together. Um, the whole plant is edible. You can use it in pesto, um, throw it into your soups, raw salads, smoothies. And it's supposed to be really good as an anti-inflammatory fungal bacterial as well. And you can also, if you're out, you can just use it as a fresh poultice. You just crush it up and put it on wounds and cuts as well. So many good things about this plant. On to dandelions. This is one, this is like the plant that keeps on giving. It's an incredible plant and you can use the whole plant again. Um, found right now blooming mostly in the spring and then another second bloom in the fall. Um, again, it's, you know, grows anywhere in full sun, um, disturbed areas. They're found just amazing places. So um, they are really beneficial to pollinators, especially for bees. So, um, but I use them a lot in tea. I'll dry their leaves or I'll dry the root. Um, again, if you want this plant to keep coming back, though, you've got to be careful about how much you do harvest. If you harvest the whole root, of course, you'll break off the plant and it won't return. But it's good. The leaves are really great in sautés, good for, like, liver um, cleansing, good raw, good in salads. I put it in my quiche. Um, the flowers you can actually harvest and uh, make a dandelion vinegar um, tincture out of it. Um, so great, but it's got a lot of vitamins in it as well as beta carotene. And it's good for your digestion and good for regulating like heartburn and blood sugars and just all kinds of good stuff. Um, and the root of the dandelion though was highly valued as a substitute for coffee um, during like the world wars here. So only these plants that had flourished all summer were used. Um, and the roots were, you know, they're really deep and were carefully dug up, scrubbed, cleaned, and dried overnight in a, in a low oven. And they were stored, and um, people uh, used them for, for coffee back then. So used for a lot of good things. Another favorite, a friend of mine just posted this on her um, social media channels about, she's an herbalist, and she just loves these blue violets, which are out right now. There are also some pink and white ones, and... Um, you know, violets are just everywhere. They'll work in so many kind of landscape conditions. And these violet leaves are just so beautiful. They have um, heart-shaped leaves, um, which indicate medicinally kind of the body that body part that they're meant for. So the medicine of the plant usually mirrors the environment um, where they thrive and where they are in your body. Um, but most of all, you know, these they bloom right now in spring, found in a lot of different um, locations, but mostly moist, shady conditions, although I found a lot on our farm in the sun. But they're really good ground cover that's tough if you want them in your landscape. And they're really delicious. They're kind of just a, an earthy greens taste. <laughs> um, but they are a very high-valued um, plant that is deer resistant and they're a host for these beautiful butterflies, the great spangled frillary and other insects. And then they provide seeds for birds and mice. But again, flowers are edible, leaves are edible, raw smoothies, whatever you want. Good for reducing inflammation and soothing your um, nervous system, 
um, great for cleansing your lymph as well and you know quelling anything that's kind of cough asthmatic related and really good for for heart support too Another one that you probably will find a lot of is the broadleaf plantain, Plantago major. Um, there's this one of 34 Plantago species around the globe, and all of them are edible and medicinal. And they're native mostly to Europe, parts of um, Asia, and it's a perennial plant that produces greenish flowers and leaves that grow and actually like a rosette that you can see the spikes there. And they're pretty low growers. A lot of these are low growers, like the violet. Um, they're about one to six inches in length, broadly lance-shaped to egg-shaped leaves, and are hairless. Um, each leaf has parallel veins, like you can see there. Like, and then if you break a leaf in half, it has strings, like you can see in that upper right um, picture. The flowers um, shoot up from the center of the rosettes and spikes, about three to 12 inches tall. And they're kind of just, you know, a dull green color, but they change from green to brown as the seeds mature. And the seeds actually come out in pods, um, and when those pods mature and split, they'll, you know, the seeds will go to the ground and reseed. So um, seeds, interestingly enough, from these pods can last 60 years in the soil, 60 years. So if you've had plantain show up in your garden once, chances are you'll see it again. Even if you don't let new plants go to seed, these are going to be around for a long, long, long time. <laughs> See what else do we have about plantain here, broadleaf plantain. So you'll see them right now through even the fall, grows pretty much anywhere. Um, I see it even in gravel parking lots. It's a tough plant, but really good for wildlife, especially small birds. Those seeds are just incredible. Um, even for the buckeye butterfly, I really love the leaves. So you can eat the root, the leaves, the seeds. Um, raw or cooked just make sure it's kind of in small doses and this is a really good plant for your stomach and healing any kind of like ulcers or anything going on in your stomach good for um, making into lotions and ointments and wound healing really good with omega-3s and um, I'll put it sometimes in salads just like little pieces of it because it is kind of like a strong flavor um, just more kind of like a bitter but I also put it in smoothies or make a small tea out of it as well. But interesting enough, those seeds contain um, psyllium, which you've probably heard of. It's a mucilage, and it gives like a really gelatinous quality when wet. So it's used as a thickening in recipes. So you could use that instead of like guar gum or carrageenan um, to thicken soups or smoothies or whatever you want. But it's also a good as a laxative because um, it helps to treat like diarrhea. So I got a boogie here. Sorry, we've got 10 minutes. I've got more to do. <laughs> so sorrel, um, this is the same family as buckwheat and rhubarb, so the Polygonaceae family. And the French translation of sorrel is sour, which is spot on. So these leaves have an intense lemony, lemony tang. Um, they're also called sour ducks. And there are three major varieties to know of. There's broadleaf, there's French, there's red vein sorrel. Um, broadleaf here has the slender arrow shaped leaves and we're going to talk about the wood sorrel in just a second as well um, but these leaves will constantly grow from the plant center early spring to fall making it a green that's almost always in season which is so great it's an incredibly easy plant to grow and other than occasional weeding and harvesting sorrel doesn't really need much babysitting in the soil at all and it's a perennial fast growing winter resistant green so if you're looking for a lot of things um, in the spring garden, you should stock up on this plant. Um, you wouldn't just want to eat, though, just a salad of sorrel, so mix it with younger leaves with milder lettuces, and blanching it also helps to tone down that um, bitterness, but it's a way to, it's very, like, zippy, <laughs> um, but it's good with, you know, um, fatty, you know, fishes or fatty things that you eat, so, because um, it's got that great lemony crunch um, you can use it as purees and in sauces and things like that, too. But it's um, some people have even put it in ice creams, which I've never done. <laughs> but again, good, lots of great vitamins, um, good for heart health. But it is very high in oxalic acid, which, again, can leach out um, calcium from your body. So you just want to be careful of eating too much of it and check with your doctor about it. 
wood sorrel. This is a, oh, such a great plant, so, so delicious. Um, you'll find this growing in little clumps too. It's not to be confused with clover, um, but this has, um, again, another sour taste to it. It's called sour grass and is found, you know, of course, in homes, lawns, parks, golf courses, athletic fields, you name it. Um, but it is the, like the typical yard shamrock that you can find in your yard because of its three leaves. Um, don't confuse it with lover, clover, though. Um, but its flower is totally different than a clover flower. It's a five-petaled yellow flower that you see here. Um, but it develops long pointed green seed pods that replace the flowers as they mature. And these seed pods are about an inch long and they are edible as well. And they almost taste like sour cucumbers. So it's something to look for. Um, but again, lots of great nutrients, lots of good stuff for you. Um, cattails, I'm sure without a doubt, um, Cattail is one of the most useful plants out there um, from its edible shoots and rhizomes, um, medicinal gels and pollens, leaves for baskets and mats to fluffy seeds for stuffing. It's a really, really wonderful plant. They're extremely prolific, not only by seed, but they also spread by rhizomes, which are edible year round, but are a little bit more difficult to collect. Um, this is, you know, a large marsh plant that can get really, really high and tall. And this plant's um, usually characterized by its large cylindrical brown spike of female flowers um, where it gets its names, its name. Um, and immediately above this large thick structure protrudes a smaller pointed light yellow spike of male flowers typically. And below the flowering bodies, the stem is really thick and pithy and the leaves of the common cattail are really just large and thin and tapered. It's a really neat plant to look at. Um, and there we got some of its seeds. Um, but like many other wetland plants, cattails do bioaccumulate toxins, so it's important to collect from a clean source, clean water. Um, cattails have also been used in, you know, cleaning up a range of toxins that have leached into waterways, such as arsenic, pharmaceuticals, even explosives and phosphorus and methane. So just be really, really careful um, in knowing the source of where you harvest your cattails. So, um, but many, many wildlife benefits from birds perching and nesting to even food sources and building medium for muskrats. Um, but they're all parts of them are edible. And the shoots there that you see on the left, um, you usually, usually try to eat the bottom part of them. And they kind of taste like a cucumber um, we can eat them raw in salads. You can actually ferment them. Um, good for soup thickening. Seeds can be used to crush as flour. Um, they can be, you know, baked, boiled, fried, whatever you want to do with them. So, <laughs> it's, and they are called like the super Walmart of the swamp for some reason because the medicinal uses of them are just infinite. Um, you can make poultices from the split and bruised roots that can be applied to cuts and wounds and burns burns and stings and bruises, and the ash of the burned cattail leaves can be used as an antiseptic for wounds. Um, they even have like small excretions within their um, main stock that are like honey that can be found near the base of the plant and used as an antiseptic for small wounds. And funny enough to have tried this though, like after you've taken all of the seed head off, you'll have a really cool toothbrush there so you can brush your teeth with it after you have <laughs> taking all the, the, the fun fluff off, but the leaves and everything of this plant have just been used for hundreds of years, you know, to make baskets and beds and all kinds of cool things. Um, last few plants here, this is the wild onions, which comprise a number of different species, all the alliums, and there are hundreds of different species of alliums from the garlics to the scallions, leeks, chives, ramps, and um, it's really re easily recognized in the lawn. It's usually out in cooler weather, um, but really recognized by the smell. I'm sure as you just touch it just lightly, you'll smell this onion, deep onion garlic smell. Um, within this family though, the ramps have really gained popularity in recent years and are actually now threatened with extirpation, like local extinction across much of their range because of over harvesting. So if you are 
um, interested in harvesting ramps, just be very careful and cognizant of how you harvest those and look, look up best procedures online. But um, not all onions are created equal. Um, and so it's good to know which parts to harvest. Um, most all parts of the onion are edible, um, but they go from you know an underground bulb. And so they're out usually like late winter, or early spring, preferring cool weather, um, preferring you know full sun. You'll find them in woodlands and even in your lawns. And squirrels love to eat the bulbs, and not many actually do really like to eat them, but most of the pollinators love the um, flowers, and they are deer and rabbit resistant, which is a good thing, so that you'll have plenty to eat, <laughs> um, but they're good to just dice up like you would use scallions for in stir-fry soups or salads, and um, really good for heart health, so you um, can check those out. So garlic mustard, I know this is a love-hate relationship for many of us, uh, this is a herbaceous member of the mustard family brought over by European colonizers and it was first documented in New York in 1868 and it was used as a source of food and medicine and it's a biennial so its life consists of a ground level or a basal year and then a reproductive or bolt year um, but it has very vigorous reproduction which has enabled it to spread from coast to coast where blankets habitats <laughs> everywhere so it's a prolific cedar, forms really dense monocultures, unfortunately, leaving really little room for native plants. Um, so it grows across all of Canada, U.S., everywhere that you could even think of, and it gets to be about three feet tall. And it's a hermaphrodite, so it has both male and female um, organs. So and there aren't many plants that look like this one. Um, the mustard leaves are quite distinct and vary from rounded kidney shaped to triangular with a serrated edge. And there's a little bit of leaf fination. Um, the flower is really, really, really tiny um, and usually comes out from a seed pod eventually forming a really stringy pod up that grows up to the sky like a stick figure with arms. Um, but they're out, it's out now, <laughs> so it's good to harvest it as much as you want to eat. Um, and they, again, can survive in really a lot of places and prefer wet or moist soils. Um, wildlife benefits, it benefits really hard to find many. Um, since it is allelopathic, not much can grow in and around it. Um, and it's self-pollinating, so it really doesn't need anybody to help it out, but midges and bees um, tend to like it, so they can use it a little bit. Um, but so really good in salads, raw or cooked, um, put it in your pots, but just be careful of like spreading it even more. But it's supposed to be really good for the digestive system. So I always eat this one pretty fresh. And mile a minute. So this is a non-native invasive vine. Um, has really distinctive triangular leaves that actually taste a little lemony. Um, and it has barbs along the stems and sometimes along the leaf um, mid ribs there. And I'll just kind of drive through this really fast, but it favors um, along rivers and streams and drops its actual seeds are buoyant into the water, so it's how it spreads really fast. But um, it is a food source for a lot of different groups of mammals, despite you know having some prickers on it, and for lots of birds and insects. You can eat the roots. I've never done that, but I've eaten just mostly um, the leaves on here, which I should have put. Um, and there's a lot of potential on its health benefits, but nothing that's like been highly documented just yet. So, um, but it is definitely known for high, to be high in potassium as a source. But if you're out and, out and about, you can definitely harvest some of this plant. And I usually just, since it does have prickers, I go from the top and I push it down to make it like a little taco and then just eat it from there, raw. And last but not least is purslane. This is a really, really great one. This is native to India and Persia. Um, and it's appreciated as a food source plant, food plant source like around the world. Yeah, most people around here just pull it up as a weed, but it's a summer annual, um, really drought resistance that forms low growing mats of succulent stems and leaves. It's um, really a beautiful plant and it only gets about six inches tall, but can get to be like two feet in diameter. 
and um, the leaves are glossy. So um, I'm trying to think of what I'll go into this slide here, but mostly um, it's coming out. It hasn't. I haven't seen it really around just yet, but it should be popping up here in June and flowers mostly in July. And it is deer resistant. It's a food source for a lot of wildlife. Um, and a lot of wildlife actually like the leaves and feed on them and eat the seeds. But you can eat the leaves, the stems. Um, young like leaves are the best. Raw young plants are the best. But it does have a tart, lemony flavor. Um, good for salads, good sandwiches, thickening things, um, stir fry, whatever you like to put it in. And lots of good omega-3s here for this one and good for blood circulation. So those are all the plants that I thought we'd go over. There's so many more, but that was kind of like my top 10 plus. Um, check us out at Restore Our Roots. Again, we're a local native plant group trying to all about people, plants, and community, getting people immersed and appreciating local plants and trying to restore um, the beautiful roots of the plants that are native to this area. We do have a website to check out and um, we have a newsletter to sign up for. We have a Facebook page as well as a YouTube station where we'll post hopefully this video coming up and we have a few others you can watch. And we also, if you want to even get cooler, um, you can get involved with us and volunteer. And we also have t-shirts if you'd like to buy a t-shirt that helps us plant more plants around the town. So you can just reach out to us through our restore our roots at gmail.com if you'd like a t-shirt and just love to say thanks to everybody um, feel free to reach out to and contact us if you have any further questions that we can't answer tonight or if you'd like to volunteer with us or receive the newsletter you can um, again go to our website and sign up there but i'll sign off because i know we're over time my apologies <laughs> but thanks so much to the library for hosting us tonight If anyone has any questions, yeah, I didn't think I see any in the chat. Not questions, but just a comment that never knew that uh, weeds were edible or they had all these properties, you know, oh, these yeah. amazing health benefits. Yeah, so. it's pretty amazing. And I think they go underappreciated. So it's nice to yeah. be able, like to change that point of view. It's so important to change that point of view. and not appreciate them because they do something for us, but just because they are as well is an important thing to just kind of shift in your mind. So um, a cool thing to thing to do, but yeah, it's it's good to know. And hopefully, yeah, some, some of you might go out now and be able to connect with more of these, what we call weeds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can shop 